Good morning. My name is Michael Kelker. Welcome to the pandemic 2020 edition of Democracy Days. I teach English at St. Charles Community College. I'm also the organizer for Democracy Days 2001 to present. And we have a really special presentation this morning. And I'm excited to introduce William Baca Mejia. He will discourse on the stock market indexes, not a macroeconomic indicator. And please note that uh, we do have a chat box going underneath the video. Please have your questions and comments flowing. I will be collating those questions and comments and directing them to our presenter. So let's make this a lively interactive discussion and let's see what we can learn. William. Well, thank you so much, Professor Kolker, for your invitation and presentation to this event. Um, I'm really excited to give this talk and of course to show that economics has something to say a little bit perhaps, uh, but not least in terms of democracy and the relevance of economic aspects of our lives to democracy. Um, let me get situated here and I will provide, uh, I will share my screen to provide my presentation that I had prepared for uh, this event. So as Professor Kolker uh, stated, uh, the title of the presentation is the stock market indexes. It's not a macroeconomic indicator. Um, I wanna go through this uh, basic points. Uh, hopefully uh, it will incitate a lot of questions coming from you guys. Um, the first uh, part is simply to understand that there is an issue going on here. And is, is the stock market an indicator of how the economy is performing? Uh, the honest answer and true answer is no, it is not. But we also have to understand that for some reason, we believe in this. There are economic reasons that I want to go through and there are political reasons that I will explore along with you. Now, there is something that macroeconomics have to say about this, because in the end of the day, economics is a social science that has in a specific field, macroeconomics, that clearly study the macroeconomic fluctuations and the effects of those fluctuations in real life. So we really need to focus on what macroeconomics say about all this stuff. What do we take into account to actually make an estimation whether the economy is performing well or not? And lastly, and this is probably the, the democracy touch here, uh, we need to talk about whether, whether the stock market is a tool of democratization of investment. We need to question that. We need to, we need to address that. We perhaps don't have uh, an honest and, and brutal uh, universal answer to that, but it is my invitation that we all start thinking about this because there's a lot of distorted message out there uh, in selling us this idea that the stock market could democratize investment. So if you check those two graphs here that I took from the FRED, uh, uh, property of the Federal Reserve uh, Bank in St. Louis, um, you see the NASDAQ composite uh, index on one side, and on the other, you see the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Every American knows what those indexes are. Perhaps uh, uh, it's vastly advertised in the media. And you can see the dip we took during the shutdown, right? Or before the shutdown and how we came back strongly in terms of a stock market, right? So make no mistake, we are right now on a roaring stock market. And the same happens with the S&P 500, right? Brutal, I mean, this is it. If the stock market is telling us something about the economy, let's just stop this presentation right now, Professor Kolker, and simply say, this is it. We're gonna be just fine, right? Nevertheless, there is a huge, a huge but here that this is my emphasis, okay? And is that, Make no mistake, you may see the, the stock market increasing in value every single day since the recovery of the stock market started. But at the same time, keep in mind, we have faced the largest decline in GDP since the times of the Great Depression, even worse than the Great Depression. We have seen the unemployment rate go all the way to 15%. Of course, it is now 8.4%. 8 
but it's still way far away from the 3.5% that is the natural rate of unemployment of the United States economy, beyond, right? Keep in mind that we have 12.6 millions of Americans continuously claiming unemployment insurance. Keep in mind that just today, 860,000 new claims were presented or were um, applied. They apply, 860,000 Americans apply for new uh, benefits and unemployment. So make no mistake, the National Bureau of Economic Research said the recession has started back in mid-February. We are in a recession, regardless what the stock market is telling you. And that's the first awakening that I need to highlight in this presentation. I need to tell you something too. And if you don't believe that this, the labor market uh, is looking uh, really, really uh, negative in this fact, in this time, look at this. Uh, the share of laid off, the laid off or furloughed workers who do not expect to be rehired is just continues to increase. We have become now more pessimistic about the idea of recovering our job. I think that's, that reflects the true the state of the economy and now the S&P 500 and now the Dow Jones and now the NASDAQ Composite Index. Paul Sommelso back in the 60s was very clear about this. He said the stock market has predicted nine of the last five recessions being of course sarcastic about it, but you get the point. It's a way to tell you, wake up. The stock market does not reflect the outcomes, the positive or negative outcomes of the economy. And yesterday, while reading the Wall Street Journal, I came across this. This is a quote from William Ackman, a hedge, a hedge fund billionaire. He says, the stock market is comprised of the biggest and the strongest companies. It is not Mr. Parker or Main Street, right? It is not representative of the entire economy. True words. For the purpose of this presentation, true words. So let's go back to the real issue here, to the honest question, to, to this uh, reasonable question that we have. Is the stock market an indicator of how the economy is performing? No, it is not. But like I said, let's explore the, the economic reasons and political reasons why we believe so, or some of us believe so, right? From the economic perspective, you find three models that somehow makes the connection between the stock market's performance and the economic activity. Number one is Tobin skew theory. It's, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it is not the theory of James Tobbins, by the way, uh, but it, the theory of portfolio investment of James Tobin, unfortunately was uh, understood by some economists uh, that that was a, a cue theory for portfolio of investment that could be associated with the stock market. James Tobbins will tell you, by no means I try to say that. James Tobbins, by the way, was a laureate in economics uh, that received the Nobel Prize. And then the second model that I want to talk about is the efficiency markets hypothesis, famously uh, presented by Eugene Fama. And the third one, probably uh, some of you have heard about this, is the so-called yield curve hypothesis. Whether it is the Tobin skew theory or the efficiency markets hypothesis or the yield curve hypothesis, they all have common features. And I want to conclude the, the part related to economic reasons talking about the common features. And you will see why those common features help us to answer this question and say, the stock market does not represent the entire economy. Well, let's talk about Tobin skew theory. I don't want to, I don't want to bring too much math here, but let me just show you the premises of this model. Uh, Tobin skew theory basically said uh, firms base their investment decisions on the ratio that defines the market value of installed capital divided by the replacement cost of installed capital, and it's very simple. If this ratio is greater than one, then managers perceived that the firm is profitable. The managers have the expectations that profits will go up. And if that is, if that expectations, it's just good enough, they will have the incentive to invest more into the economy. 
in real terms. By this, I mean buying a capital, buying equipment, buying machinery, building factories, the real investment that affects the GDP, the gross domestic product, the total output of a nation, of a country. All right, so that's, that's good. When that Q is greater than one, there is the incentive to invest more. Now, where do you get the market value of the installed capital? From the stock market. So that's why you see the connection there. Uh, the, other, when, the other scenario here is that when the Q is less than one, when this ratio is less than one, managers will not invest in capital. They are observing that the market's value reflected in the stock market of their installed capital, it, it doesn't look profitable. So they do not have the incentive to invest more real capital into the economy and that could depress the GDP. So you see the, the, the point here of those who believe in the Tobin skew theory and claim to have the explanation of the association between the stock market and the economic activity. The other theory that could help us, at least from economic reasons perspective, that could help us to understand why it's such association is the efficiency market hypothesis. This is a good one, right? Because, and when I said a good one, because the assumptions are extremely strong, unrealistic. Nevertheless, it's, it's highly value in the stock market. The key idea is that expectations in financial markets are equal to optimal forecast. So all investors in the economy are capable of optimally, optimally forecast the rates of returns of every single stock out there. How do they do that? Because they have access to, in the best possible way, to the best available information and make these forecasts. And, 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 and if that is true, then the prices of stocks will fully reflect all available information. And voila, you know where this is going, right? It's telling you that my investments in the stock market are the highest possible efficient ones. And by definition, that reflects in the economy as well. Okay? And the key to understand this is the importance of arbitrage. Right. Remember that a stock market is uh, it's usually presented as the best example of a perfectly competitive market. And arbitrage is an essence of the perfectly competitive market. So if your forecast, right, it's above the what is called this R uh, asterisk here or R star, allow me to call it like that. If the optimal forecast is greater than the optimal, uh, excuse me, if the optimal forecast is greater than the equilibrium rate of return represented by R start, that means that someone knows something that I don't know, right? And, and let me put this in lay in layperson terms. Out there, there is a lot of books, a lot of books that tells you follow the institutional investors. They have titles like that. If you want to trade using your Robinhood app, follow the institutional investor. So why? because someone knows this, someone has this forecast. So if you use that available information, then you go to your app on Robin Hood and simply play the game doing your arbitrage, otherwise uh, calling uh, trading stocks. But let me go back to the pure theory here. If the rate of return, the optimal forecast of that rate of return happens to be greater than the uh, presumably equilibrium one, you know what's gonna happen? People will buy that stock. Because if Mr. Warren Buffett knows something about this, it must be true. So people go and increase the demand of that stock to the point that the price of the stock will go up. But that will bring down the rates of return in optimal forecasting terms eventually. So. Once again, that notion of arbitrage that pushes the supply and demand in the stock market, that's why the stock market moves like this. This is just to show you why we always, in theory, reach this equilibrium. And just imagine the consequences for the economy of this. If we always reach this equilibrium, right? If we always reach the efficiency market result in the stock market, that must mean in economic terms that the allocation of resources is efficient as well, right? But once again, look at the variables that these theorists are using 
And look what we're missing. Have I talked about unemployment rate? Am I actually saying something about the GDP? Did I mention something about the price level, the inflation rates in the United States? No. You see? So that's why these theories, they, they could be suggestive from those, uh, uh, for those economists in particular who want to believe that the stock market could predict the outcomes in the economy or the outcomes of the macroeconomy. Now, um, the last uh, economic, the or economic model that you could see here, it's what we call the yield curve hypothesis. This uh, hypothesis simply associates the yield to maturity uh, with, uh, of course, the terms of maturity, three months, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, right? And these are the different yields of return that you will get if you invest on those ones. Uh, this is very, there is, this is a very, very famous hypothesis to the point that we have, we have theoretical uh, suggestions or there are theori theoretical implications when you understand the yield curve. You see this is yield curve, this is the current data for the United States. This is actually the most recent one that I could find from September 14 to yesterday. Look at that, the yield curve is, has an upward slope shape. What does that mean? It means that the financial markets, the capital markets have this idea that the economy is doing great, that good economic times are around the corner. Get it? If it was inverse, and I'm sure you have heard this on the news, when it's inverse, it means that bad economic times are around the corner. Right? And, this is, and this is amazing. The yield curve is telling us that good economic times is coming, but at the same time, we just got a, a slap in our faces today that says that 860,000 Americans just file for unemployment and 12.6 millions continue on unemployment benefits, right? And the GDP is not expected to grow, but until the third quarter of 2022. It goes back to the pre-pandemic level. So keep that in mind. Right? These theories are just using variables within the financial market. It's not going out and knocking the doors of what is happening to a, a classic American average household or Mr. Parker on Main Street who happens to have a bakery. Right? So the common features of all these theories is that they are based on expectations. Some of them assume that expectations are rational some of them tells you that it's so rational that we use all available information to understand the direction of macroeconomic policy, to predict what the fiscal policy means for my pocket, to predict what that monetary policy means for my pocket. Right? They are based on expectations. And here is the issue with expectations. It is, don't get me wrong. It is unfair to assume that economic agents are idiots, right? Who is going to argue against the possibility of rational expectations among human beings? Nevertheless, we can also add a little bit of psychology here, right? And there is also, there is also a, a vast uh, research dedicated to behavioral economics that explains very well how expectations fails to be rational sometimes. And that's important to know that. Unfortunately, three previous models that we have observed rely heavily on rational expectations. Although James Tobin will say, I don't do that. The interpreters of my cue did that. Let's be fair with Mr. Tobin here. And I'm bringing psychology into the picture because like John Minor Keynes said in 1936, there are waves of optimism. There are waves of pessimism, right? And right now, when you see that stock market indexes going up, it's just reflecting that they are just optimistic of what could happen, but they don't know if it actually is going to happen. I see, I follow the financial news, of course, as part of my professional duty, and you see all these wealth fund managers telling you, you know what, we really don't know what's happening, but we like how the stock market is looking. 
we we oh we recognize that the economy itself the real sectors of the economy they are not coming back as strongly as it has been advertised but we like the stock market so they look at the quote i show you about this billionaire a hand a hedge fund manager he said it is not representative of the entire economy they know this they know that the stock market is like Joe Miner Kane says, it's a big casino in which you go and gamble for a future that seems to be optimistic if we're talking about our current events. It could be also a future that could look pessimistic, right? So when you talk about the waves of optimism and pessimism that emotionally charge those investors in the stock market, that leaves room to think that irrational, irrational behavior could be part of the financial markets, right? Could be part of the financial markets. And, and it, it is irrational, let me tell you why. The stocks of United Airlines, Delta, and other airlines, they are skyrocketing. They are even growing at rates that we never saw before. But just today I heard in the morning that 50,000 workers of the airline industry could be laid off starting October, right? If that doesn't seem irrational to you, then I don't know what else to say, right? Clearly, this waves of optimism and pessimism could cause irrational behavior in the market to the point that we're just gambling that the recovery will be strong and we'll be back in January of 2021 like we were before the pandemic hit us. But those are the economic reasons. And I want you to keep in mind that probably those theories somehow have influenced some economists that have gotten the privilege of working in the White House. And there comes the political reasons. Economists in the White House, I always, uh, I always like to joke to my social scientist colleague, we are the only social science that have out of an office in the White House. We have the National Economic Council of Advisors to the President of the United States. And several of them have been there and several respectable and you know, very, very reputable economists have been part of that uh, council that has become a revolving door between the academic world, the National Economic Council of Advisors, and then some position in Wall Street. And I have to, I don't have time to highlight all of the directors, but I want to highlight probably uh, key directors that are very eloquent in expressing that the stock market has a relationship with the economic activity. I want to talk about Gregory Mankiw that served under George W. Bush administration. I wanna talk about Lawrence Summers, who served uh, on the administration of Clinton and Obama, President Obama. Right. Both Mankiw and Summers, they share this idea that there is an association between the stock prices and the economic activity, understood as the GDP. They, they both share that idea. They have endorsed papers, research, uh, Lawrence Summers uh, in particular, he has written about that, right? And, and, and they endorse the idea that, you know, uh, Tobey's uh, Q uh, hypothesis, it's relevant to understand the connection between the stock prices and the GDP. They go ahead and tell you when the value of Q falls, so it's less than one, like I showed you in previous slides, that suggests pessimism among investors. That means that they will retract any investment plan and that's going to affect the GDP because investment is a key component of the GDP. They also argue that the stocks, if you own a stocks, that's part of your household wealth. So if stock prices go up, you have more leverage to consume. If the stock market, if stock prices go down, then you don't have too much leverage to consume. Your wealth is reduced. So by definition, you should not be consuming them. If, you know, and that is in terms of consumption and investment. So it, they say that the stock market prices could affect the aggregate demand. Technically the, the, the whole, demand of the economy, that's what they are arguing there. 
But they go beyond and said it could even affect the aggregate supply, which reflects the potential uh, outputs of the economy, the capabilities of production of the economy. Right? Because if the stock market declines, it suggests that something bad is happening in terms of technological progress, and that affects the long run economic growth, which is related to the aggregate supply of the economy. They go ahead and said that could mean perhaps not that we're going to see a total reduction of the aggregate supply curve, but at least indication that is going to start growing less and less and less. Right? So they, they Mankiw and, and, and Summers have been very, very uh, eloquent presenting this uh, theories. And they, of course, remember they were in the White House. Right there, they were in the White House, and, and and keep this in mind: these economists have access to the president of the United States anytime. Right, and if the president has a question regarding economics, that's why they are there. Right, so keep that in mind. That's that's a a political economy reason that could explain why why somehow we believe that the stock market reflects what is happening in the economic activity. The current director is Mr. Larry Cudlow. He is not uh, an, a scholar like Mankiw and Summers. He hasn't written papers like Mankiw and Summers. He doesn't have that academic background. He served under Ronald Reagan's administration uh, and he is serving currently as director uh, of uh, Mr. Trump's, uh, President Trump's uh, administration. So you could see, and I can tell you this, Larry Kudlow is a strong believer of the Laffer curve, which means he believes in cutting taxes in order to boost economic growth. And, and he goes, and then you may think, well, there has to be empirical reasons why this is true. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm going to say the Laffer curve doesn't have well-grounded empirical evidence. But this comes from Mr. Codlow's perspective that uh, he does not believe that the government needs to intervene too much. Ergo, reduce taxes. He doesn't have too much theoretical reasoning behind uh, this stuff, uh, but he likes to simply state and shows, always showing you the graphs I show you at the beginning of a lecture, the stock market indexes, showing us that the rising value of the stock market is an indicator that the economy is doing well. And he even goes beyond. I mean, Mankiw and Larry, uh, Gregory Mankiw and Lawrence Summers have not stated what Mr. Kudlow has stated, that the stock market is an indicator of the democratization of investment. He has gone that far. And here's the problem with that. that you may think then that Americans have, all of us uh, happen to have an investment in the stock market. The reality is that we don't, right? The other day, some numbers were released that I wanna share with you and have a significant value. If you understand having a stock in the stock market is having a 401k, well, I have bad news for you. 79% of employers offer one and only 14% of employees accept one. And on top of that, I have other bad news. Americans in average used to own more stocks back in 2002, and now the percentage is declining. It used to be 68%, now it's going down all the way to 55%. So democratization of investment, I think more elaboration is required from Mr. Kudlow on that front. So what does macroeconomics have to say about this? Because let's go, let's go to the theory, right? We know that I started with some economic theory that could explain how that message enters the White House and, is, and they start selling from political purposes, of course, the idea that the stock market represents the economy. That was the first intention. But now let's talk about serious macroeconomic theory, right? The field that economics have dedicated to explore, to study the macroeconomic fluctuations. 
And I can tell you that all what you have to do is to check the fundamental macroeconomic aggregates of the national accounts. If you don't know where to find them, make this a monthly visit. Take the habit as a good citizen and click on the Bureau of Economic Analysis every month and read the brief summary that they offer. In that way, you learn how are we doing in terms of consumption? How are we doing in terms of investment? How are we doing in terms of government purchases and government investment? What is happening in terms of international trade, meaning the net exports? The Census Bureau or the US Labor Statistics Center can also provide information about the labor market, not only unemployment rate, but jobless claims, continuous jobless claims, et cetera, et cetera. And the Fed has a tremendous database in which you can always check what's going on in terms of the inflation rate in the United States. So all those variables that I just mentioned there that you can check by yourself instead of going to the headline that says, the economy is booming because the Dow Jones is booming. All this is public and available to you. And I guess my point here is to tell you that if you really want to know what is happening to the economy, you must pay attention to the fundamental macroeconomic aggregates. You should understand, look at this graph here. You should understand that consumption, that consumption represents about 68% of the US economy. That's very telling. In fact, it suggests that if our labor market is not coming back as strongly, American households don't have disposable income to spend because they don't have jobs. So if American households don't have money to attend to a market transaction, that suggests that the outlook in the macroeconomic perspective doesn't look favorable. The other component is private investment. You can see that, well, the, the uh, I, I present in data from 2019 and the first quarter and second quarter of 2020. Uh, but in 2019, it was 18% of the GDP, while consumption was 69% of the GDP. And you can see how the recession is clearly affecting all of these components that I'm showing you. Right? And you can see how the government has to step in, right? increase their share of, uh, of contributions into the GDP the government purchases because it is, it is necessary. Now, with respect to investment, you can see, well, I, I hope it's self-evident that consumption is the big deal. Investment and government, uh, in private investment and government investment clearly share the second, the second uh, position here and net exports, uh, Every time I go to the Federal Reserve and I ask uh, the, the you know, full-time researchers, they say that exports, it's important, but it really, it really doesn't represent the vast volume of production of the US economy. Where is it? It is here, consumption, investment, and government purchases and investment. So it's really funny how they take the issues related to international trade and become uh, political weapons. And I don't understand that. But once again, it could be someone sitting in the National Economic Council. So what you see here is in terms of investment, I wanna go back to this point, is that there is a difference between portfolio investment and capital investment. I spend a considerable amount of my class explaining my students that when you buy or sell a stock, you are not investing in the economy. But when you buy a new piece of equipment, you build a new factory. Even when you buy a new house, that is an investment in the economy. Buying a piece of paper and selling it later for a higher value, it is not an investment. It doesn't mean anything. Portfolio investment, it is not included in the national macroeconomic accounts. Keep that in mind. So that tells you as well that, you know, all those theories that suggest that, well, stock market investment affects the GDP have a serious, have a serious item to explain here. 
The other thing that I want to make emphasis besides telling you that consumption, investment, and government purchases are relevant is the labor market and the price level, particularly the inflation rate. Those are good thermometers of where the economy is going. And it has become extremely relevant now, right? Uh, the labor market, all this information that we get on a weekly basis in terms of jobless claims, continuous jobless claims, uh, it's important to have it because that tells you, that shows you the trend towards where the unemployment rate is heading. But like right now in the current environment that we are uh, so trying to survive, uh, the number of jobless claims has become steady. So that means bad news for the unemployment rate is not gonna be 3.5% anytime sooner. The V-shaped recovery that we were promised, it's not happening. In terms of inflation rates, you have heard on the news what the Federal Reserve Chairman, Mr. Powell has said. It is time to let go inflation a little bit and be focused on jobs. You know why? Because he knows, he has clear that if you look at the fundamental macroeconomic aggregates, one of them, the jobless situation is serious. He's not looking at the stock market. He gets to calm the stock market with his message, but he's not, like he said yesterday, I am not here to save the stock market. Right? That was the message that was very loud and clear. We're going to be focusing, keeping our interest rates really low to restore the level of employment that this economy needs to have. And if the inflation goes above 2%, let's not freak out about it. That's how you do microeconomic analysis. You look at the fundamentals that I'm presenting here. You don't look at the stock market. Now, make no mistake, someone probably is getting ready to tell me, well, to get information of the macroeconomic aggregate accounts, it's kind of a, a, a pain in the neck because those macroeconomic aggregates are released with a lag. Yeah, it's true. Just to give you an idea, the, the third quarter will end in, in, in September but we will know for sure what's happening with the third quarter of the US economy only until the last week of November. And if we wanna know what happens with the fourth quarter of the GDP in the United States, we will have a full report the last week of January. So you're asking, you basically are telling me, right? Or probably thinking you're telling me to follow this but they operate with a lag. Well, I have good news for you. We have high frequency data publicly available too, in which you can consult anytime if you want to. And one of the most powerful ones that I have seen in the last uh, uh, four years uh, is the weekly economic index created by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. This weekly economic index is built using precisely high frequency data spending in credit card, spending with debit cards, jobless claims, manufacturing production, information that comes out on a weekly base, real estate investment, construction investment. I mean, they compile all that information and built an index that, as you can see, perhaps does not reflect the actual number the actual rates of growth of the GDP, but it certainly offers you a good picture where we are, as you can see, right? This is, this is the big dip we took because of the uh, pandemic. Right? And you see how slowly we're recovering. So if, if the V-shape, uh, it's happening, we should be here right now at the third quarter. Guess what? It's not happening. This is telling you, this number that you see here, minus 6.23%, reveals that that is the negative economic growth that we probably see in the third quarter of 2020. And probably will continue to observe negative numbers all the way through 2020, the fourth quarter included. If everything goes smooth and we go back to levels that are pre-pandemic like this one here, it's gonna take us up to the second quarter of 2022. The recovery, unfortunately, is not a V-shape. 
right? And I want you to look at this graph and think about the first ones I show you, right? That we're showing a tremendous increase in the value of stock market indexes. I want you to think that a lot of Americans are thinking right now that they will not get back their job. I want you to think that the permanent numbers, the permanent closures of businesses, it's increasing faster and faster. 98,000 business announced they are not coming back. I want you to see, to think that if you think a spending is phenomenal in the United States now, well, it is starting being phenomenal and everyone got excited and thought that the V-shaped recovery was gonna happen, but bad news, it is now flat, indicating that there is a number, a continuous number of layoffs that is affecting our economy. It is telling you that the connection between the labor market and that 68% of the economy consumption there is too much. There is a gap that we need to work on, right? And at the same time, think about those things that I told you and, the, and how wonderful the stock market is looking and how wonderful the yield curve is looking. And perhaps if James Tobin's Q theory makes sense of how wonderful it is to continue to invest in portfolio. My point has been and is that there is no such a thing, there's no theoretical reason to claim that in real terms, the economy is substantiating the gamble that the stock market is taking. And this is a serious issue, right? Because the stock market has been referenced as the tool for democratization of investment, not only in the United States, but all over the world. In my native Colombia, we were so, this idea was sold to us. Right? We had a social security that was totally privatized under the notion that if you put that money instead in the stock market, democratization of investment happens. Go find how many Colombians are claiming pensions or retirement plans right now. Go find out, Google it. And Beck came back to me with an email and we discussed having a cup of coffee, a virtual one, of course. Right? Stock market is not a democratization of investment. It's not the way, you know, because 1% of American owns half of the value of a stock market, right? And on top of that, the richest 10% own 87% of the stock market. And I told you earlier that Americans have reduced their share of Americans who buy a stock have reduced their share. They stopped buying a stock a long time ago, since 2002. We are on a clear tendency that they are not doing that. So you see the disconnection here, right? And, and, and again, we have to have an explanation why, why do we, we have to think that the stock market, it is the tool to democratize investment. You can have the reasons, uh, probably the, the mastermind behind this is Mr. Milton Friedman. I have nothing against him. I do love Friedman. When I read Freedom to Choose, I decided to become an economist for your surprise. But certainly when he wrote Capitalism and Freedom, he made every single possible mistake that he could. He sold us the idea that if you have free market systems, democracy will happen. Democracy and democratization of investment automatically emerge. Tell that to the Chileans that were under the strict government of Pinochet for 17 or 18 years. Right? So free market economists do not open the system to a democratic value. Look at the Chinese model. Right? Politically, the, the Communist Party is in charge of every single thing. Economically, laissez-faire, laissez-passer, like the French said. But it's not opening the door to democracy. So let's be fair with Friedman. Perhaps his passion for the free market system went beyond. And he didn't 
probably he couldn't see that 1% of America was going to own half of the value of the stock market. He couldn't see that. He thought that efficiency market, efficient markets will suffice to provide investment to all of us. Let's be a little bit fair with him, but capitalism and freedom perhaps is the reason why you have the current director of the National Economic Council stating that the stock market is a reflection of the democratization of investment. And then you have the other guy, the, 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 the member of the other team, because between monetarists and Keynesians, there has been a huge rivalry that you and I are not going to settle. But Keynes, in chapter 24 of the general theory, he brilliantly presented this idea of socialization of investment, of course, misunderstood by critics of him like socialism. But socialization of investment uh, idea in Keynes is it's quite simple. It is, it is understanding that gambling in the stock market, even in the banking sector, he, goes, he dares to go to that part too. Those type of investments are simply transfers of papers. But when I buy a factory, I am creating jobs. But when we build a road, we are creating jobs. But when we build a hospital, we are creating jobs. When we build a community college, we are creating jobs and providing an honorable service to our society. Right? The socialization of investment in Keynes is that is to understand there is a huge difference between portfolio investment that only looks to buy cheap and sell it more expensive later and real investment, which actually create jobs, affects our normal lives for good, of course. That socialization of investment. And Keynes, when developing this, he said, sometimes that's why the government must lead the path, not control the path, must lead the path to socialize investment. Because by definition, the private sector is not interested in socializing investment that much, as you can see how the stock market gives you that clear example. So I just wanna add to conclude that if you don't want to believe me, that's fine but certainly believe William Ackman, who is a hedge fund billionaire that clearly states that the stock market is not representative of the entire economy. If you don't want to believe me, that's fine, but believe Paul Samuelson, a Nobel Prize laureate, who said that the stock market has predicted nine of the last five recessions. And look at the facts and make the conclusion, the obvious conclusion, that the stock market, unfortunately, does not reflect a democratization of investment, not in the United States, not even all over the world that happens to believe in the idea of having a financial market with all the perks they have. With that, I will conclude my presentation and I will be really happy to uh, take questions and of course address them and hopefully provide a good answer. Excellent work, William. Thank you for that. Uh, that was really stimulating. And we do have a couple of questions. Uh, one person has asked, uh, what is the economy now compared to the stock market crash in 2008? Worse or better? And I think it is a, a good episode in our recent history to bring up the, uh, the comparison and contrast between that stock market dive and where we are now. What would you say? Well, um, the dive we took in 2008 and 2009 was, was real, was very deep because it has a real connection with the real economy. It, you know, the dive that we took in 2008, 2009 was extremely well connected with the performance of the housing sector, housing market in the United States. So for that reason, you could see that there was a clear connection between the GDP going down between 08 and 09 and the decline in the stock market. That decline was more severe in my opinion because it really affected our conditions of life for a long time. It really squeezed the liquidity in the economy. And let's be fair, okay? Let's be fair here. The Federal Reserve never expected something like that, 
right? The, exuber the rational exuberance that Alan Greenspan uh, started talking about after this event became obvious. They were not ready for this. Uh, nevertheless, we learn a lot. Now, let's go back to the current year. This could have been worse, but it wasn't because we learned so much for, from 08 to 09 that look what the Fed did, right? That, that Sunday afternoon, I remember coming back home after a long day with my family. Uh, they clearly said the Federal Reserve took action. They don't even meet. They immediately cut the interest rate all the way to almost 0%. Right? And it started announcing the next day, that Monday morning, I remember, that they were going to pursue large purchase of assets in order to calm the financial market. And, and you see that it has been working pretty good, right? Because the stock market went up while Mr. Parker on Main Street is struggling to sell a loaf of bread. Excellent point. We got another question. How does the increase of thrifting in the USA affect the economy? Does it increase our standard of living for clothing or is it for the environment? Well, I have bad news there. Unfortunately, I, I wish we were being a little bit thrifty. <laughs> the paradox of thrift, like Keynes would, would argue, we, we are not in, in thrifty times. In, in fact, uh, Jaffer Sachs, two years ago, he published a book saying, we have a crisis of national savings. Uh, per, because employers do not offer pensions anymore. Uh, people are, they are, it's up to you if you want to have a 401k. So national savings, they are actually down compared to what it was in the generations of our grandfathers, for instance, who enjoy today a pension. We don't have that privilege anymore. Um, I would say, I will start from there, Professor Kolker. We do not have a thrift uh, evidence. We don't have a thrift a scenario that uh, makes us or could help us to think whether or not the economy is saving more or saving less. If we wanna talk about the environment, uh, the United States, in my opinion, in the last 10 years, and look what the, round, the business round table announced yesterday, that they are in for climate change, regardless of if we're part or not of the Paris Agreement. They, and they wrote a letter to the president saying, we are in, please do not do this now. Right? Because all the investments in the last 10 years were focalized to that point. So we may not have the national savings, Professor Coulter, but we do have the private sector, the business round table, which is a very, very special group saying we are in for climate change. So I guess the short way to answer that is we do not have a thrift situation, but we do have the commitment from the private sector, which is which, which tells me that we should take advantage of that. We should take advantage of that. I've got a question. In, in looking at you know, world events and following international news, you hear the term austerity measures in, you know, that are being imposed a lot. Is there a theory of austerity when, when we hear that is there a playbook uh, or is it kind of ad hoc from situation to situation, depending on the time and the nation? There is, there is a uh, professor Kolker and, and allow me to be passionate about this. It is called the neoliberal agenda. Uh, it is the belief that the government must not intervene to solve anyone's problems. It is the belief that if we are in good times, the government should save. And even if we are in bad times, the government should save, right? Because the conception of austerity is supposed to affect the national savings level. So if we are austere, we will increase the national savings and that is good for the long-term. If you believe only in the long-term, that makes sense. I wanna be fair there. But if you understand that macroeconomics is about what is happening today and the ramifications that eventually will be faced by the future generations, let's be practical like Joe Minor Keynes because in the long run, we're all dead. So right now, to be more clear, Professor Coker, um, it is not time to think about austerity. Look at what happened yesterday, Professor Coker. In real terms, the interests that the, that the US government can't afford to issue new debt, they are negative. 
they are negative in real terms. So it is like great momentum to expand our spending, to recover this economy, to contain the virus, which is the key here, with all the public, with, with the effort of the public, with, with the effort of the public investment, and get out of this hole perhaps quicker than we were supposed to get out. A comment, uh, or actually a question just came in, and this is really good because this offers some uh, summary opportunity. Uh, how much of an, of an effect does economics have on a nation's democracy? I would say a lot. I would say a lot. Um, I'm, a, I'm a true believer of institutional economics. And I was sharing with Professor Kolker before we started this that I am getting passionate about economic democracy. And make no mistake, when resources are concentrated, whoever has the money sets the rules, unfortunately. And democracy is not about that. Democracy is, is remember the, 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 you know, I don't know if, Pro, if Professor Rossler is in the audience, but democracy is about, is about the little guy. Remember our constitution. Democracy is about giving the power to the little guy, right? We, the people, it's about that. It's about understanding that even though I am a small, I have a voice that you need to listen. But the concentration of resources, unfortunately, only makes possible, and we can see that that somehow gets normalized through the exercise of lobby, uh, makes possible that whoever has the money sets the rules of the game, Professor Golker. So it's detrimental for the economy to have bad economic moments. It is detrimental, not only at the democratic level, but also look at the, uh, the racial differences that we have here in the United States. Right, it, it, it visibly is affecting more the minorities than the white population. I mean, it, it is it is outstanding. Even though we have been told that African Americans have the lowest possible unemployment rate and Hispanic have the lowest possible unemployment rate, it really doesn't matter, right? But it, because they are still higher than uh, if you compare it to the white population, <laughs> right? And so you may you may repeat that several times again. But that is not evidence of democratization of the resources. In fact, reassert that whoever has the money sets the rule of the game. And that's a threat for democracy because it's supposed to be we dead people. Very good. And this is kind of a related question. Do you need a strong economy to have democracy in action? I think it helps. I think it helps. Let's go back to the history of the United States. When the United States has started, right? It was not a strong economy. It was not, it didn't have even a currency, by the way. Uh, so I would argue that you need a strong economy eventually, but you need to start from a strong values, uh, dem democratic values, like we did. You know, We founded a country, uh, with the belief that eventually we were going to pursue the happiness and freedom. Just think about this, Professor Kolker, like uh, a family that has an income does not have to rely on anyone, right? A family that has an income does, doesn't have to, it creates independence of their own opinions. Uh, they become politically active or not. And I'm saying this because when you go to developing countries, I grew up in one, you see that when there is no middle class, when there is no that income coming, then that family relies on the promises of a politician. Then it's no longer a citizen, but a servant. So I do think that you need, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make the mistake of Milton Friedman. You need first a strong democratic values. You need to, you need to make your society solid in that aspect and of course, translate that into the economic sphere, which it works in the United States. I mean, we went through the golden years of capitalism. We are the reason why the whole world wants to be capitalist because it was working for everyone up, up to 1979 when things started to change dramatically in terms of income inequality and all the stuff. Just had a question come in. Do you think we will ever have a stock market crash as severe as the crash of October 1929? Well, uh, we we got it. 
It, it happened in March of this year. Um, it was just uh, quickly sustained. The, the problem with the 29-1 is that it was sustained for weeks. This was immediately uh, resolved because of it, because now we know in macroeconomics, we have learned how to deal with this, how to, how to play with the emotions of the stock market. Um, uh, I, with, with, uh, without any intention to become political here, just, just remember when uh, President Trump just got elected and started announcing tax cuts, the stock market went up and he was not even in office, right? And it took them a year to do that. And it's still the stock market, just every time he tweeted, the stock market got excited. So, and, and I'm saying that that's a really sad way to manipulate the stock market, but with an instrumental macroeconomic policy like we have today, it has become obvious that I, I want to say, Professor Kolker, although I, I could be wrong one day, that we will hit bottom, but it will not be sustained like it was in 29. Interesting. I think that's all of the questions that I've been reading uh, in our chat box. And uh, several people saying thanks, thumbs up. Yeah, that was a great hour of power. I know I've learned a lot. And as someone who's interested, vitally interested in this, uh, I don't have the kind of background that I need to perform the analysis that you just gave. So this has been a great uh, hour of teaching and learning. Well, it makes me it makes me really happy and uh, to hear that. And uh, let's announce, Mr. Professor Kolker, that perhaps next year we'll come back with some economic democracy toppings. I'd love that. I think that would be highly relevant. So unless we have any more comments, I don't think so. We see some thanks coming in. So, and thanks to everyone for attending. I really appreciate that. We have two more sessions, including Sergeant Heather Taylor at 11:30, and then a session on voting and uh, the myth of fraud and allegations therein. So this has been great. William, thank you so much. Thank you for having me into consideration, Professor Calder. Absolutely, let's see you again next year. Thank you. Thanks everybody, bye-bye.